No, I speak on behalf of the organizers of the, the colloquy of the uh, Classe di Scienze o Scuola Normale, uh, because they are all absent today for one reason or another, uh, and uh, Chiara asked me to introduce the speaker of today. And uh, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to have here Professor Lee Roberts from Boston University. Now, you know that in physics, progress usually arrives on the press when you make a big discovery. It's good because people get attention. I mean, recently uh, we saw on, on the in putting together a, a telescope as big as the Earth in order to measure a black hole. Or uh, the, three years ago, there was uh, the, the Higgs boson arriving uh, from LHC. But the progress in physics uh, is made uh, also because uh, there are people that uh, can measure things uh, with a precision that is uh, absolutely fantastic. You know what is the weak interaction? Huh? The weak interaction is uh, G Fermi is, gives a scale of the weak interaction. Huh? And the Professor Roberts has been in the experiment measuring G Fermi with the precision of 0.5 per million. Huh? That is uh, an amazing result. And uh, in the last uh, 25 years, huh? Professor Roberts has been struggling uh, on a topic that is also very close to Scuola Normale. Uh, he has been struggling in measuring the G minus 2 with uh, an unbelievable precision. He will tell the details. But uh, G minus 2 is close to Scuola Normale because uh, G minus 2 was uh, the battle horse of Emilio Picasso, that is our, uh, has been our past director. Uh, and uh, uh, Emilio was uh, central in doing the experiments at CERN on G minus 2. And also Lee will also, I'm sure, discuss about that. So. Ali, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be back in the Scuola Namali. The last time I was here, Picasso was actually the director, and he had many questions, as he always did. So he was a terrific physicist and a great friend. Uh, yeah, you, thank you. <laughs> there we go. So what I'm going to do today is to tell you about experiments that have been going on for decades. And this is uh, starting my third decade about today <laughs> as, uh, as a leader. And the uh, experiment uh, was called, it's called the muon G minus 2 experiment. So I have to explain what G and why it's minus 2 and all that. Uh, the instructions I received in my invitation said that they're held on Wednesday at 3, so we're ahead of time. And uh, it's a unique opportunity for faculty visitors and so forth uh, to are willing to address an audience in containing biologists, chemists, mathematicians, and physicists. We understand that this is a lot of work. So I've been searching for any connection with biology, and I realized that all of the work I'm going to report on was done by Homo sapiens. So I'm going to answer some questions, what, why, who, and so what. So we have the standard model of particle physics. And it seems to explain everything we've measured. And uh, people are trying in many different ways to find something beyond it. And since this is a broader audience, I thought I should uh, briefly, be, briefly review the standard model and explain what and why it's interesting. So it turns out in the standard model, there are generation structure. And the, we're in the first generation, that is the atoms inside of us. Uh, they have electrons, and there's also a neutrino associated with it, a neutral particle. Uh, I think named by Pauli? No, Fermi. Fermi, okay. Uh, and then the second generation is called the muon, and as we sit here, one per square centimeter per minute is going through you from the cosmic rays. And then there's the tau 
uh, which took many years to find and was found at Slack. These guys interact, our atoms are using the electromagnetic force that make atoms, and the weak force is governed by these two guys, uh, plus this Higgs boson, which was found a few years ago. And uh, that sort of completed the picture, and then there are three families of quarks. We're made of up and down quarks. And they interact strongly through the, the gluons. So there's the electromagnetic force, the, <coughs> the um, weak force, and the strong force. And so I'm going to focus on this guy, which is really special, because its lifetime is 2.2 microseconds, which is practically forever on the subatomic scale, which permits very precise measurements of its property before it decays. And its mass is 207 times the mass of the electron, which gives it special sensitivity to physics beyond the standard model, all of which I will explain. So there are fundamental questions in particle physics. Why are we here? Why is there a matter, uh, antimatter asymmetry that allowed the early universe to end up as a matter universe? Uh, why mass? Well, the Higgs. That's one thing we can check off. <laughs> What's beyond the standard model? Well, there's a theory called supersymmetry that says for every particle we know about, there's a companion particle, and in one of my Colleagues said, well, at least half the particles have been discovered. And what's dark matter and what's dark energy? Because this standard model we know about is about 4%. And so I'm going to focus on an experiment trying to figure out what's beyond the standard model and searching for clues. So how do we find what's beyond the standard model? Good question. Well, the Large Hadron Collider has got the highest energy collisions and the chance to make the heaviest things possible there. And thus far, they found the Higgs, which is important, but expected. And we're waiting for something new. Precision Frontier, you, you, you need a very intense beam, and then you measure something very, very precisely. And uh, so, you can make intense beams of neutrinos. The U.S. is uh, having a major program on that. And then uh, intense beams of muons. We also have a program on that, but the Paul Scherer Institute has uh, also a very strong muon beam. And so what I'm going to tell you about is increasing the precision of the muon magnetic anomaly. And that, um, you will understand why, is interesting uh, by the time I finish the talk. And in fact, I say here as a preface that uh, the muon G minus 2 experiment has got the only tantalizing hint that there is something beyond the standard model. And I won't worry about what is it. The theorists worry about that. Uh, we're a, a large collaboration now. We have significant uh, contributions from Italy. and. Uh, a couple of my colleagues are here who played important roles. So let's go back. What, what, what is a muon? Well, <clears throat> it was first observed, the first published observation was in Sight for Physique uh, in 1933 in a Wilson cloud chamber. They saw this track that was more heavily ionizing than electrons, and uh, it was a particle of uncertain nature. There's the original German for you. And it was identified for sure uh, by these two guys. And um, so what the heck is this thing? People were looking for the Yukawa meson, which carried the, the strong force, which is we now know is the pion. And that was much harder to discover. But this muon lived for a long time. And therefore, it was found first. So the magnetic moment. There's an intrinsic magnetic moment due uh, that's associated with the spin of a charged particle. And uh, this uh, G factor has uh, a value 2 and then an anomalous part A. And so this quantity G minus 2 over 2 is the magnetic anomaly. And that turns out to be where the exciting physics is. So if you put a, a magnetic dipole in a magnetic field, there's a torque. 
And there's also an energy mu dot b. And this we teach our beginning students, right, in E and N. Uh, and for a spin uh, particle, uh, there's a torque, and you get the spin precession, Larmor precession. And, uh, oh, yeah. Here's the vector diagram, if you want to look at the. So here's, here's the torque, and this is the direction the spin turns with this. Uh, I've, I've made it a negative uh, particle. And it's just like the gyroscope. In fact, if we knew gravity and we knew that precession frequency, we could calculate the moment of inertia. So here's the uh, precision chart in particle physics. And uh, of course, there was a lot of uh, fanfare that the Z mass was measured to 20 parts per million. But already at CERN a decade before, they had measured G minus 2 to 7 parts per million. Uh, these two experiments I've been associated with. Uh, G Fermi was measured at Paul Scherer Institute, and G minus 2 was measured at Brookhaven. It's half a part per million. Here's our goal, 140 parts per billion at uh, Fermilab. And the electron G minus 2 is known much better. It all started with Stern and Gerlach, the measurement of magnetic moments. And so Stern published a paper, uh, uh, How to Look for Space Quantization. And uh, Gerlach knew how to make a very strong quadrupole field. Because if you have a dipole in a uh, field, the net force is 0. If you have a gradient field, then there's a net force on the dipole. And so you put this beam of silver atoms through this uh, uh, gradient field. Can you see that? I guess so. Uh, and so without a magnetic field, they got the one band. And with the magnetic field, they get two bands. And you know, today, I don't know what you say here, but in the States, we say in our modern physics course, and that showed that uh, spin was one half. And actually, they expected two bands from a relativistic theory by Zummerfeld. They were happy. And it took some number of years before it was understood what was going on. And in fact, in modern language, we understand that G factor of the silver atom, and that's where the electron, the unpaired electron, was two. Uh, it was up to these two bold graduate students, Carl Smith and Muhlenbeck, to put forward this idea of spin and actually get it published to explain the fine structure splitting in uh, atomic spectra. And uh, so what they said is that uh, if you have uh, a spin one half particle and a nucleus going around it, there's a current. And so there's a magnetic moment interacting with this current. And uh, the only problem was, they got an answer that was too large by a factor of two for the fine structure splitting. And it was all sorted out by Thomas, another graduate student, who uh, pointed out that the, the, you needed a correction from relativity. And then we call that Thomas precession now. And so uh, many, many years later, uh, Thomas wrote to uh, Hansmann. I think you and Uhlenbeck have been very lucky to get your spinning electron published and talked about before Pauli heard of it. It appears that more than a year ago, Kronig believed in the spinning electron and worked out something. The first person he showed it to was Pauli. Pauli ridiculed the whole thing so much that the first person became also the last, and no one else heard anything of it, which all goes to show that the infallibility of the deity does not extend to his self-styled vicar on Earth. And we talk about the Pauli theory of spin and teach it to our students. Yes. There's a certain irony there. Uh, so Fitz and Taylor at uh, Illinois knew about spin, knew about all of this. And they did the stern gerlach experiment with hydrogen, which was significantly more difficult. But they did see with no field and a broadening with, uh, and, and basically confirmed that this magnetic moment of the electron was uh, was, was uh, the same as uh, Stern Gerlach. It all began with Dirac. Dirac was trying to make a relativistic wave equation, and sorry, oh okay, uh, a relativistic wave equation, and 
Much to his surprise, he also explained the magnetic moment of the electron. Spin, the whole thing was built in. It's amazing. All your graduate students must go read Dirac's first paper. It's like reading a textbook, and it's absolutely brilliant. And if you do the non-relativistic uh, reduction of the, uh, of the, of the uh, Dirac equation in a weak magnetic field, you find that L is equal to 1, G sub L is 1, and G sub S is 2. The next big development was uh, Schwinger's calculation of the first radiative correction. So I'll have to talk about that for a minute and explain what a radiative correction is. Um, but this is uh, Swinger's memorial stone uh, in, the, in the cemetery where he's buried. And this opened up the field of radiative corrections and quantum electrodynamics. So, and, and it goes beyond just alpha over 2 pi because there are higher orders. The perturbation expansion and there are higher orders. So virtual particles increase the muon magnetic anomaly. This is the Schwinger term. And so the arm waving argument, you've got the uncertainty principle, uh, delta E delta T, so you can violate energy conservation briefly and have these virtual particles appear. And uh, the energy you've got available is roughly the particle's mass, right? And so the electron's mass is uh, very small. It's about, uh, the muon's about 200 times heavier, so you might expect that heavier things would contribute more to the muon than the uh, electron. And uh, this is very important. And for example, the Z boson contribution uh, is essentially negligible even at the parts per trillion that A electron is measured, but it's significant for the uh, muon G minus 2 because of this fact. You get a factor of uh, basically m mu over m e squared contribution of heavier physics to the muon. So the muon provides a great laboratory to study physics beyond uh, the standard model and physics beyond. And of course QED is an industry now and the tenth order contribution, five loops, 12,700 and some Feynman diagrams, lots of supercomputer time to evaluate all those integrals. And uh, so when Gabriel first published his electron uh, G minus 2 that was so precise with the pinning trap, uh, he made a comment that this was well beyond what anybody expected when they invented QED. And so he got a quote from Freeman Dyson. And I, saw, I thought I should get my own quote from Freeman. Uh, and he said the main point was that all of us who put QED together, including especially Feynman, considered a jerry-built and provisional structure which would either collapse or be replaced by something more permanent within a few years. So I find it amazing it's lasted for 50 years and still agrees with experiments to 12 significant figures. It seems that nature's telling us something. Perhaps she's telling us she loves sloppiness. So. Uh, <coughs> QED is amazing, and uh, I'll come back to this later. So in order to calculate the standard model value of the muon anomaly, you need to know all of the standard model contributions. So, sorry, I'm feeding back. Um, and so there's the electromagnetic, which now goes to thousands of terms. Uh, there is hadro virtual hadrons. The strong interaction contributes. And there's a, a next order uh, strong interaction contribution as well. But I've shown you the relative sizes of these. So QED dominates, which is if you want to be sensitive to all this stuff, you have to make a more precise measurement. And furthermore, there could be uh, unknown particles x and y that could contribute in loops. So let me just show you the. Uh, Experimental value from Brookhaven. Uh, this is uh, 63 of these units, which is 0.54 parts per million precision. And this is the standard model value recently published in FISREV D this year, or, or last year. And the difference is about three to four and a half sigma, depending on whose theory evaluation you use, which is fairly interesting. 
And we're not looking for a bump, we're measuring frequencies, which I will explain. So here is a bunch of uh, recent theory calculations. Since 2003, the strong interaction contribution has been pretty steady. It's just increased in, in, in precision. And uh, so here's our BNL limits, and here is what Fermilab we expect to do. And so if things don't move, you could go well over seven standard deviations. And that was just sort of drove the design of the experiment. This shows both the CERN measurements and our measurements in showing this. They're quite consistent, in fact. Uh, and any time you have a de deviation from the standard model, the theorists go wild. And so they've had a decade or so to go wild over our results. And so last I checked, there's over 4,000 citations to our papers. So there is some interest out there. So how do you measure the magnetic moments? And I just show our two, uh, uh, our present uh, precision and our uh, projected precision. And so Robbie, who also said, uh, who ordered that when the muon was discovered, uh, said, never measure anything but frequency. And that's because you can measure frequencies very, very precisely. And so how do you measure the frequency? Well, we have to use the miracle of parity violation. So for those of you that are not sure what parity violation means, if I look in the mirror, I see a man holding up his left hand. It's very disconcerting, in fact, to see a video of yourself where the, it's, it's the proper hand because it, it doesn't get reflected. And so parity is basically this uh, mirror reflection symmetry which turns out to be violated in the weak interaction, meaning there's a preferred direction in space. So here's a, a pion decaying to a muon, and we now know because of parity violation, this neutrino is left-handed. It's spinning this way. And there's no right-handed neutrino, although people are searching for such a thing. That would be beyond the standard theory. And so that means that the uh, muon has a definite spin because you have to conserve angular momentum. And therefore, the muons are produced polarized. The weak decay, <coughs> here's where the two neutrinos uh, are uh, going back to back and the positron is going in the other direction. And so these guys are zero total angular momentum. So the spin of the, of the muon is carried by this positron, information on that, which gives you a handle to know where the spin was when the muon was born and where it was when it decayed, which is what you want to know if you want to know how fa far something processes. And uh, maybe I won't go into detail on those. So the first uh, experiment at Columbia Nevis that discovered, uh, that measured parity violation, and there was also a University of Chicago experiment, but this is the one that did a counting experiment. So they brought a mixed beam from their uh, cyclotron uh, into, uh, of pions and muons, into this uh, degrader where, par, where the pions were stopped and the muons have a slightly longer range. And so then the muons stopped in this carbon target and then they looked for the decay and uh, with just two uh, simple uh, counters here. So this is the experiment that was probably put up in three days when they decided it was interesting to do. And uh, they, what you wanted to look for is the angular distribution because that's if it were not uniform, it would be a sign of parity violation. Uh, and so uh, they've got one counter. How do you measure an angular distribution with one counter? Well, what they did was surround their target in a magnetic field, take a narrow time slice, and then change the magnetic field. So then they're sampling diff the complete angles, and by golly, this is what they got. Clearly see parity violation. And they measured the g-factor and found it to be 2. 
Now this was very curious. Here's this strange particle and it appears to be uh, like a Dirac fermion. They didn't give up and you'll discover later on why this is the hardest way to do this experiment. And they found that in fact they had the alpha over 2 pi as well. And this said that the muon was just like an electron in a magnetic field, which is remarkable. And it, uh, along with the discovery of the, of the uh, muon neutrino a few years later, uh, actually uh, really pointed to this generation structure of the standard model. So I want to talk about spin motion of magnetic field because if you're going to measure, you need to know what the equations are. So the uh, cyclotron frequency, if you have a uniform magnetic field, the cyclotron frequency is given by that. The spin uh, rotation formula is given by this, where this is the Thomas precession term. And uh, the spin turns relative to the momentum with this difference frequency, which is directly proportional to the anomaly. So you get three orders of magnitude sensitivity by measuring the difference frequency. And that's why I say the Nevis experiment was so damn hard. <laughs> because they had to do three decimal places just to see this swinger term. Uh, and so the thing that was invented at CERN was that uh, you used a uniform magnetic field and an electric quadrupole field to focus the muons. Why? Because you need to know the magnetic field experienced by the ensemble of muons. And if you have multipoles in your magnetic field and moments of your muon distribution, they couple and you need to know exquisitely the, the, both the multipole distribution, the magnetic field distribution, and the muon distribution. And so this trick of using electric quadrupoles uh, actually made it much easier. So here's the full spin equations. And you notice the cyclotron frequency has this motional magnetic field term. To a relativistic particle, a magnetic field looks like a combination of magnetic and electric fields just special relativity. So you get this motional electric field. And this is the full spin equation that Thomas published a long time ago, but written in modern notation. And if you take the difference frequency, you discover that there's this term. So that says that uh, if the uh, trajectory is not perpendicular to the magnetic field, and in the spinning trap, you've got this kind of motion which we call a pitching motion, you have to, it changes the frequency. So you have to take that into account. And the, uh, this motional magnetic field, if you have a non-relative, here's a parallel plate capacitor, non-relativistic uh, uh, particle that goes through there, this charge is going to fall. It's like a gravitational field. If it's ultra-relativistic, the spin will get ahead of the momentum. And so you might guess there's one magic value of gamma that the spin follows the momentum. And that's called the magic gamma, and that's when this term cancels. So we measure both the uh, spin precession frequency of the muons and the magnetic field. And uh, then we calibrate the uh, magnetic field to the lawnmower precession of a free proton. And so we do these experiments blinded, so we don't know the clock frequency. Uh, at Fermilab, it's plus or minus 30 ppm. <laughs> so there's no way you're going to get an answer. Uh, and we have independent teams blindly in analyzing, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, we had a relative unblinding of one set of analysis, which I'll show you. OK, so if this, this week, focusing, uh, accelerator physicists would call this a weak focusing betatron. Uh, in fact, it's a uniform dipole field vertically and this uh, quadrupole field that provides the vertical focusing because otherwise, no, without some kind of focusing, you get a helix. And so for positive muons, you've got this top plates plus. And there's the beam coming out at you from this picture, because I know the direction of the ring. So here's the uh, penning trap sitting at uh, Brookhaven. 
it's uh, about 15 meters total diameter. It's excited by superconducting coils. And this is what we had to move to Fermilab. Uh, here's what you're looking at. It's a cutaway. Notice there's no gaps between the steel. The largest gra gaps were 20 thousandths of an inch, whatever it is in microns. <laughs> okay. And uh, it's a C magnet because you've got to put detectors here. And if it's a C magnet, the flux return on this side is different from that side, so you get an inherent quadrupole that you have to get rid of, and I'll tell you how later. And this is compared with Gabriel's penning trap at Harvard, which is a few centimeters across. <laughs> so the experimental technique in a nutshell, you start out with a narrow bunch of protons, you hit a target, lots of junk comes out, you select pions that will give you the muons you want, then they decay to muons, you bring it through a magic magnet I won't talk about that brings it into the storage ring, and in a uniform field, you come back and hit where you started. So you've got to provide some kind of kicker to put this on, on orbit, and then you need these quadrupoles for focusing. So that's basically this experiment in a nutshell. And you then put uh, 24 calorimeters around to, uh, to uh, measure the decay products and, to, and give you this muon frequency. And you measure the frequency omega a. So the muon lifetime is 64.4 microseconds since it's a magic gamma. The period is 4.5 and 4.4 microseconds. And the cyclotron period is 149 nanoseconds around. So we do a blind analysis. I need to talk about this for a minute because uh, um, if you know the answer when you start analyzing the data, or you know what you'd like to get you can bias the decisions you make. So how do we remove this bias? Our absolute clock frequency at uh, Fermilab is blinded uh, to 30 ppm. Since we're measuring a fraction of that, we don't know anything, which is really liberating to be free. We have uh, independent uh, teams analyzing the magnetic field. And uh, there are two major analyses, actually three. Uh, we have six independent people analyzing our run one muon frequencies. Uh, initially, they're blind to each other. Once you think it's mature, you then unblind relatively and see if you agree with your friends. If you don't, somebody made a mistake, and you don't know who made a mistake, and you have to figure it out. If they do agree, you say, oh, good, we can go on to the next data set. <laughs> Only when everything is complete do we get the true clock frequency and the people from, outside the, uh, from these people outside the collaboration that have it. And using the word of k on physics, so where you had a box in phase space you didn't look in, we open the box. And of course, there was a famous box put all bad things on women, I guess, is what I read, uh, that out came all kinds of bad stuff from Pandora's box. But it's a surprise. So let me just show you, this was installing a pole piece in, uh, in the uh, magnet. Can, can you close those blinds so we don't get so much light on the uh, screen here? Or is that not a blind that closes? Sorry. Yes. Problem with the light. Yeah. Keep closing. All the way. Hmm? Yeah, you can see better now, right? She needs some lights. Okay. Well, okay. This is much better, right? You can actually see that this pole piece, which is several tons, is suspended on this special fixture. And there's kapton on the ends. Why? Because if you have a quench, you don't want eddy currents running all the way around the magnet. You want to localize them. And uh, here shows where the calorimeters go into this notch in the vacuum chamber. So there's very little material. Well, here it was starting to take it apart. You can see the steel came out. It came in on a truck and can go out on a truck. However, these coils were built in this room. 
So what do you do with that? Well, you build a 40-ton fixture to hold them. You get it outside the building. There it is. Uh, and it, it, here, here it's nude. They, then they shrink-wrapped it. And uh, it had to be moved along the roadways. Here it is coming down the William Floyd Parkway on the way to uh, Smith Point Marina. And of course, you have to close the roads. And uh, to tell you a brief story about Brookhaven Lab, uh, the locals are very suspicious of the lab. There's always something they think is going on. And so amongst the things that they think is that an alien spacecraft crashed on somewhere on Long Island, and some people will show you where. And uh, it's at the lab. And some people even believe there's an alien at the lab. And you think I'm joking, but I've had a number of people when I've told this story says, oh yeah, I was riding the limo out from uh, LaGuardia Airport and the driver told me about the spaceship. So it's true. So anyway, this, there was a viewing area and this, there was this guy there, a local, that saw this coming down the road and he says, that's a spaceship. And he went on and on with the rant. Uh, this is a cover up, you know. So it was, and I wouldn't believe this except that Summer intern caught it on his iPhone. It was hilarious. So there it is coming down the road. Uh, here it is with the big moon. Here it is being craned onto the barge. Here it is on the barge, an innocent bystander. Here it is going by the arch in St. Louis up the Mississippi. Oh, you can barely see this. Uh, okay, so we started out in Long Island. We had to port for five days because the seas were rough here. Then it went all the way around Florida. The Mississippi was flooding, so it went up the Tom Bigby Waterway and eventually joined the Mississippi and eventually ended up at, uh, on the shore in, uh, at, at Lamont. And then we had to close roads for three nights, including two uh, interstates. I'm sure the drivers were not happy at two in the morning. And here it is at Fermi Lab. So you can put it back together again. And uh, so at Fermi Lab, we can make more or less the dream, uh, the, the beam of our dreams. Uh, it's not perfect. One would prefer more than the HF booster for making the pions, but okay, you can't have everything. So we take 10 to the 4, uh, 10 to the 12, 4, 10 to the 12, uh, protons out of the machine, we then rebunch them to four bunches, so you lower the instantaneous rate. And so they get stored in this recycler ring, we peel one off, we hit a production target, which is the old anti-proton target. Then we go into what's called the delivery ring, which is the repurposed debuncher ring, and uh, all the pions go away. At Brookhaven, we had a 75 meter beam line and there were lots of pions, and that was a background problem. Then you put them in the storage ring and you measure G minus two, or it could be easier. Uh, I just want to uh, particularly acknowledge uh, in Italy the contribution from our Italian colleagues, particularly on the uh, laser system. And Carlo Ferrari back there can tell you more details, right? <laughs> and, uh, so we have tracking chambers inside the vacuum. And so when a muon decays, uh, it can go through these tracking chambers and you see a track. A lower uh, momentum one has a shorter time of flight because it curves, the radius is, larger, is smaller if it's lower momentum. And uh, so here shows uh, these tracking chambers and you can see a trajectory very nicely there. Uh, they're only about this high, and they have to have, uh, all the electronics are here, the gas comes in through these manifolds, and so forth, and so from here on is in vacuum, as you can see, and the beam is going into the, into the board here. And, of course, depending on the momentum of the decay positron, you can see f further back in the storage ring, and one of the first things that was done is to look at the momentum in the tracker and the energy in the calorimeter 
And these are positrons, where the energy and momentum are basically equal. And this little bit is muons lost from the storage region. Because there's almost no energy deposit in the calorimeters. But, uh, and you can reconstruct the beam distribution. You say, oh my goodness. <laughs> it's supposed to be a nice circle in the center. Uh, and that's because our kicker magnet has not reached its design field. And by the way, this kicker magnet has to turn on, kick the beam, go away, and not leave a field behind more than a tenth of a ppm, and that has to die out quickly. So it's, it's not a simple particle kicker. And if you do the projection, you say, oh dear. Nevertheless, and we have to make a correction for this E field, but it turns out that it's not nearly as bad as we initially thought. Uh, so, this is a plot showing if you set a single energy threshold and as the spin is turned around, you get more and less high energy positrons. Remember, they're correlated with the muon spin. And so uh, this is exactly what you see. The sinusoidal oscillation as the spin turns around. And if you just take the tracker and make a momentum cut, this is exactly what you see. This is the G minus 2 precession. And uh, that's uh, pretty amazing. But the calorimeters who have much better timing. This is our uh, so-called 60-hour data set, and I'm allowed to show this, um, which has about 1.2 parts per million sensitivity in 60 hours, which is, is good. And uh, it's folded back on itself, because if I made it straight, it would go way across the roof. So, uh, but you, you can see there, there's no, f well, maybe there is a fit function, but basically you would, agree that it looks like cosine omega t plus phi with the muon dilated lifetime. However, oh, there's, uh, so we got many wiggles per uh, muon lifetime. And the sensitivity goes as 1 over the square root of n. However, there's a 2 because these are completely correlated. the phase and the frequency. Here's a Fourier transform of the residuals to that five parameter fit, and you see lots of things from beam dynamics. And I, I'm not gonna talk about beam dynamics unless I get a question, but the beam is like a beam in an accelerator, and so you have to understand that and correct for it. And this, this coherent beam oscillation is the beam, when it's bunched, moving back and forth, see, seen by a detector. And you can see that the fit isn't very good because there's still some omega A in there. So the fitting could, I could give you an hour seminar on fitting, which I won't. So here were uh, the 60 hour data set. Everybody's blinded to each other. Here is relatively unblinded. And we all heaved a great sigh of relief. This was done in real time. And we all said, oh, good, on to the next data set. So let me tell you in my uh, waning moments about the magnetic field, which is amazing. You see, we have a tube like this where we've got the muons stored, and we need the field, we need to know the field to sub ppm level, and we need to have it as uniform as possible, and this is a 44 meter long tube. It's only three-tenths of a cubic meter, but if you think of a 44-meter long tube, that sounds a bit harder. So we have these uh, 12 yokes, and uh, there are these top hats, which you can adjust the uh, effective mu of the magnet by moving them up and down. Of course, they're big pieces of steel. Uh, there are the poles which we moved up and down and shifted around and stuff to micron level. Um, and, well, you can't see this too well, but these are the pole pieces sitting on the ground before being installed. 
uh, there are these wedges that can both move in and out, which changes the dipole. And the, the angle of the wedge sends out the quadrupole. There are these edge shims, which basically uh, shim the sextipole. There are 8,000 little pieces of iron, which I'll show you a little later, stripes, custom put on G10 and then uh, glued to the pole piece. And there are surface coils with two and a half millimeter spacing that go all the way around that we can power individually to, sh to, sh to shim higher multiples and also to correct if there's a radio net radial magnetic field that raises the beam and so we can recenter the beam with that. It's a, it's a major, major thing. And, uh, When we're running, we have uh, 378 probes in the, bedded in the outside of the vacuum chamber that monitors the field while we're running. And uh, every once in a while, we stop the beam and we run this little trolley, which uh, has a, an array of probes, which are clearly designed to do multiple decomposition, that measures uh, many, many, many points. And, uh, it's just a standard NMR probe. We're using petroleum jelly because it doesn't evaporate like water, which we tried at Brookhaven and we learned that the probes were dying. Um, and it, it's perfectly stable. <clears throat> it was studied by one of our postdocs very carefully. Uh, this just shows a free induction decay, uh, which very good signal to noise. So in a single shot, you get a 30 ppb measurement. So this is precision uh, NMR magnetometry. Let me just show you when we first turned on the magnet, this is a shimming trolley with a whole bunch of probes that goes out to much larger radius. And uh, you can see these, these gradients are just telling you that there's lots of, it, uh, I'm sorry, these, these beading tells you there's lots of uh, gradients in the field, which you knew when you turned it on and you had 10 to the minus 4 if you're lucky with a good magnet. Uh, so I have to... Uh, Let's see. Where, where, oh dear. Ah, there we go. So this shows shimming the field over time. Uh, started uh, in September, October of 15. And first they moved the top hats. Uh, no, first they did the pole pieces. Then they did the uh, top hats. Then they adjusted the wedges, and the blue is uh, Brookhaven. And you keep going, and you keep tweaking, and you keep doing things. And at first we were calibrating, you know, if you move something so many millimeters, how does it change? That was why there were these wild variations. And here's where we ended up. This is 100 ppm, over 44 meters. And uh, this is, this is uh, azimuth, okay. And uh, here are the little stripes of iron on G10, each one custom cut and weighed and whatever. And so here is the field averaged over azimuth. And why can we say the F average, azimuthal average is the important thing? Because the beam slowly moves up and down and in and out. And so it samples the whole magnetic field. So it's this azimuthal average that counts. Here's the dipole moment, and this is 100 ppm. The RMS is 15 to 20 ppm, over 44 meters. And we run the trolley at different times of the day just to make sure there's no stomatics. Uh, the fixed probes monitor it, and we've studied the, the, how the fixed probes track the real field with the trolley. And we eventually cross-calibrate uh, each of the trolley probes to an absolute calibration probe. So there's a huge amount of uh, magnetic field technology. And we normalize to the uh, uh, magnetic uh, field to a alarm more frequency of a free proton averaged over the muon distribution. And so this is what we measure, and these all come from the literature. And that's what gives us the anomaly. With this systematic error budget of 70 ppb, 
on both the muon frequency and the uh, magnetic field. Uh, here's an aside that's recently come available. The quantum electrodynamics contributions depend on alpha, the fine structure constant. Remember, alpha over 2 pi was the lowest order, and so the next order is alpha squared and alpha cubed and so forth. And a new measurement of alpha, independent of the electron g minus 2, has come up with a value that's different from what the electron g minus 2 gives you. So here's, here's the uh, alpha from Lawrence, uh, from the University of California, Berkeley. And here is what you get if you use the electron g minus 2 to determine alpha. And so there's a difference, a small difference. Uh, and so Gabriel's is planning a new experiment 10 times more precise to the electron to see. And the other amusing thing about this is that this is the opposite sign of the muon de deviation. So maybe there's something there. Maybe it's not. 2.4 standard deviations. OK, whatever. OK, so let me uh, conclude. So the muon magnetic anomaly has an independent role, uh, an important role, in the development of the standard model. And I think I've persuaded you of that. Uh, in the generation structure of the model, the first two-loop electroweak calculation, which turned out to be really hard, the uh, necessity of including all of the standard model forces, including the electroweak, and in fact, the, the two-loop electroweak calculation lowered the electroweak total contribution by about 25%, 20%. There's a possible difference with the standard model, which is sort of the holy grail of particle physics today. And the interesting thing is the measured value of the muon anomaly is a sum over all physics, known and unknown. The question is, for this new physics, what's the mass and what's the coupling to the muon? And we've got this new experiment online. It's, um, we've got about 1.4 Brookhaven with a constant conditions this time in run two. Uh, we look forward to analyzing that where it's much simpler than run one where nothing, not, there was no time when everything worked <laughs> for a long stable period in run one. So, if this new result from run one agrees with the BNL result, we could easily go over five standard deviations. We'll see. Or we could come close to the standard model. Who knows? But if it's a statistical fluctuation of this distance, we really made a mistake. And we keep asking ourselves, those of us from the old experiment, did we up? <laughs> And we haven't found anything. We've found effects, and then we've gone and, oh, it, it's, not an, it's not important. So uh, I just wanted to end with this picture of the collaboration standing on the magnet at Brookhaven, which would never be allowed by the safety people today. Um, in fact, there's no guardrail. There's no anything. We're not on you know, harnesses from the ceiling. And uh, in looking at this picture, I realized how many dead people there are there. So Frank Crean, and he was a, a a uh, chief engineer at CERN and, and worked on the G-2 experiment there and then came and worked on our experiment. Francis Farley, who did all of the CERN G-2 experiments in our first experiment, he died at 90-something uh, uh, last year. Uh, Vernon Hughes, who started the Brookhaven experiment, uh, didn't live to see the final result. And Gordon Danby, I don't know how he didn't get in this picture because he designed the magnet. <clears throat> it was his magnetic design with all these shimmy tools built in that made it work. So the question, is it going to be inside or outside of the standard model?
Thanks a lot for the very nice talk. Are there questions? I, I have two. So one, uh, the first one is, uh, is the following. So I, I, I saw that the LAC measured the light by light scattering, which is giving, I think Atlas has some uh, events where two photons are, I mean, one photon is emitted by one proton, another photon is emitted by the other proton and they scatter. Yeah. So that the question is whether this uh, knowledge can, uh, can help no? the, the making the, the prediction more accurate given that it's one of the contributions? Okay, so that's a good question. And uh, the LHC is a difficult place to try to study that. Uh, there are data from uh, previous electron facilities that actually do gamma star gamma or gamma star gamma star scattering. And that's important, uh, if I can go back to my slides here. Well, first I have to find the mouse. Uh, okay, so the question is how do I get back to my home screen? Not that way, not that way. Ah, great, here we go. So the, the light the light by light is relevant for this diagram. That's, oh, there it is, thank you. Uh, so this diagram is two photons in, two photons out, if you want to look at it that way. It's called, that's why it's called light by light. And this is a hadronic bubble. And so at electron machines, there are data on, um, it, it is dominated by the pi zero pole, which is, you know, uh, I don't think I have that picture anyway. The pi zero pole, instead of this blob, you put a pi zero pole in there and there's two gammas on one end and there's two gammas on the other. And so, uh, with existing data, in fact, uh, uh, Colangelo and other uh, collaborators have calculated using dispersion relations instead of models, the pi zero pole, using gamma star gamma to pi zero. And what they found was that they agreed absolutely right on top of the model predictions, which have been used before to estimate the light by light. And of course, you get much higher intensity in an electron machine than you do in LHC. Uh, there is a program of uh, two photon physics at BESS, which is an electron machine in Beijing, that is taking data now to add to this dispersion approach of determining the light by light. And of course, the, 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 it's the pseudoscalar poles, the pi zero, the eta, and the eta prime that are important, but the pi zero is the dominant one. Okay, thanks. So, and then the second one is, uh, you mentioned that there is another experiment in the very last slides, that there is another experiment which measured the, the fine structure constant, which measure, which oh, kind it, of experiment? Oh, it was published in Science uh, uh, in 2018. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a University of California, Berkeley, Holger, Holger uh, Müller? Which kind of, so it's not a G minus two? No, no, it's, it's, so it's, uh, it's, oh, it's cesium okay. atoms ah, cesium. <laughs> dropping them, you know, with incredible, it's an incredibly complicated experiment because it's so, so precise. Are there other questions? I was curious. When you displayed the blinded uh, results, so there was a, one group with significantly higher uh, uncertainty with respect to the others. It, it's because of different systematics? Uh, the one, the, you're very observant. The one with the higher, uh, all of the analyses except for that one use individual events and then sort them in a certain way and fit them in different ways. Okay, 
uh, which we call the so-called t-method, because you've got everything as a function of time, and then you, you do a fit to that. The q-method is sort of in the spirit of the uh, very high intensity parity violating electron scattering experiments where they just integrate. And so in the Q method, you basically take all the events and you get a little less statistical significance, but in principle, more statistics. However, because of uh, co com computing limitations for the playback, because we have lots and lots of data, uh, we don't have as big a data set there. So it's just a smaller data set. And of course, all of those different analyses that I showed you that agreed uh, have very common data sets, but some of them are quite different in their approach and they're sensitive to different effects. And we're thinking about how to put them together. I mean, one choice is they all agree, take this one. But uh, we, we have uh, Alex Kajervasi, who was the K of that uh, uh, K and T theory evaluation, uh, who had to put together all of these disparate sets of E plus C minus data to determine the hadronic contribution, is now in our collaboration as a postdoc. He switched to, to experiment. Uh, the job prospects are better. And uh, so he's thinking about how to put all these correlated data sets together. So we might do it. I guess right, if you'd call that right. <laughs> a funny question. Can you observe a CP violation in your experiment? No. Well, I mean, at Brookhaven, we did mu plus and mu minus, and so we looked for CPT. Uh, and of course, we didn't find it, or you would have heard about it. But, uh, and there are these models by uh, Alan Kostelecki and, and collaborators about uh, Lorentz uh, and CPT violation, looking for uh, diurnal variations and so forth. And we also did that analysis at Brookhaven. We didn't find anything. But that model's got so many different parameters, even if you, it's, it's a very complicated model. Okay, thanks a lot. Let's thank the speaker again.